I would like for you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning, please, to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 18. We're going to be looking at, at some things this morning. We've kind of had a theme for the last several weeks on uh, the abomination of discord was a few weeks ago. Last week we uh, ministered on the four lepers of the, the siege of Samaria. And that theme has been uh, offense or disunity that's created. And that is one of the, if not the number one tool of the devil, the enemy, is to come in and divide. And division cause, causes uh, unity to dissipate or it creates disunity or division, different visions. So why is that so important? Why, why do we need to look at that? Well, if that is a, it, it may not be the number one tool, but it is one of the best tools that the enemy uses against us. So it's good for us to be able to recognize it. It's good for us to be able to overcome it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things going on right now. There, <laughs> Society is being faced with attacks on all fronts right now. I mean, my goodness, it, it is, uh, there, there is unrest uh, where health is concerned in, in this country. I mean, people are, are, are scared. Now, now, listen, I'm not, I'm certainly not making light of what's going on. Uh, the things that we're facing are serious. There's no question about that. But one of the things I want to remind you of is that we are people of faith. Now, that doesn't mean we're goofy. That just means that we're people of faith. And God is still in the healing business, just like he's always been in the healing business. And God is still in the protection business, just like he's always been in the protection business. But remember, it takes faith to walk in these areas. And you've got to be careful not to allow yourself to be uh, drawn in or, or, or for you to succumb to fear where that's concerned there are divisions among a lot of different elements of our society you have to be very careful right now not to get offended not to get mad at people these are tools of the enemy to rob you i want to remind you you remember jesus taught us on the the uh, parable of the sower and he said this was the granddaddy of all parables and the granddaddy of all parables talks about the different types of ground that the seed is sown into. And Jesus said, the sower sows the word. So he's talking about sowing the word or speaking the word of God. And he says that that falls on different types of soil. And, and the soil that he's talking about is the human heart or your heart, your spirit man. So the word or the seed that you're sowing, you're sowing into your heart. So what type of soil is your heart? Is your heart hard or is it soft and receptive to the seed? And one of those things, if you remember, that the thorns that come up are uh, the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of this world, and the lust of other things entering in. Well, you see that all around us right now. And what, what you've got to be careful of is the word that you have been speaking that has been working, that has been growing, if you're not careful, if, if you fall prey to some of the tactics of the enemy right now, then it will cause thorns to start coming up and choke out the things that you have been believing for. So that's why it's dangerous to us um, right now during this particular time. I, I've heard people, and I know I've mentioned this several times because I keep hearing it every week. There are people right now that think we're in the middle of the tribulation period. We are not in the tribulation period right now. The, the, the plagues of God in the, in the book of Revelation are not being poured out on the earth right now. The judgment of God in the book of Revelation in the tribulation period is not being poured out on the earth today. I know that's hard to imagine because things, people think things are really bad right now. During that period of time, they get really bad. They get far worse than what we're dealing with right now. So we're not in that phase. We're not in that dispensation at this moment. But I want to address something kind of in, in line with what we've been talking about for the last several weeks that I would believe will help you. And I want to kind of do this in reverse order this morning. Uh, so I want you to look in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. And we're going to start reading in verse 18. We're reading out of the New King James translation. Now this is written in red in your Bible. This is Jesus doing the talking. And He said, Assuredly, or verily, I say to you, 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you. Now, again, I say to you means he has said this to them before, right? Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth as concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them of my Father, which is heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. All right. I want you to remember there are verses of Scripture in our Bible that are qualifiers. Uh, we, we like to quote pieces of Scripture, and we typically like to leave out the qualifier to a particular blessing or promise. This, to, to look at this particular verse of Scripture, I just want to check here for just a moment. Uh, verse 19, again, I say to you that if two of you... So let's just look this morning. Are there at least two of us in here this morning? Yes, there, there, I can see you out there. I can hear you breathing. There are more than two of us in here today. Uh, if you shall agree on earth, all right, are we on earth? Now, we fly over, and we kind of make light of that about being on earth. But, but I want to I wanna draw something to your attention. Do you know Jesus didn't just throw words around? Jesus was not uh, frivolous in his talk. As a matter of fact, he said, for every idle word, you'll be judged. Jesus didn't throw out idle words. When he said something, he, he, it was thought out very carefully. It had meaning to it, and we need to pay attention to it. And I want you to notice in this verse of Scripture, he could have just said, if any two of you agree concerning anything they ask. Couldn't he have said that? But I want you to notice what's in there. Now, Jesus, for some reason, thought it necessary to put that if two of you agree on earth. Now, in just a few moments, I'm going to draw attention to something that's going to be really important where that's concerned. That is a key to understanding this passage of Scripture. He said, if there any two of you shall agree. <laughs> I think sometimes we forget what agreement is. Agreement... A lot of times, you'll, you'll pray with someone, and you'll get down the road, and about a week or two or a month later, you'll hear them talking, and you go, wait a minute, that's not what we prayed. And what you'll realize after that period of time is, we were not in agreement. What, what happened is, they wanted you to do their praying for them. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the power of agreement. The power of agreement that is standing together of the same mind, the same vision, standing on the Word and agreeing on it is a very powerful thing and will come to pass. Didn't He say it will be done to them, my Father? Which it will you, come to pass. He didn't say when, but He did say it will come to pass. So, if you agree, that's not tolerate, that's not, we're almost, you know, we, I kind of think what you're talking about. Agreement is you agree down the line with each other. Anything that they ask, it'll be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, I want you to notice that there is something here in this particular verse of Scripture. Do you notice there's two places that are mentioned in this verse of Scripture? The two places mentioned in this verse of Scripture are earth and heaven. Is that correct? God is in heaven. We are on the earth. So apparently, these two places, heaven and earth, are working together. I mean, you can, inf uh, uh, you can infer that from just this verse of Scripture. Right? Okay. Verse 20, he says, For where two or three are gathered together, my name, I am there in the midst of you. In other words, I'm, I'm joined together with you. So now then, if there's two together and then Jesus is in the midst of us, how many does that make? Three. Do you remember over in the Old Testament it says that a threefold cord is not easily broken? It talks about that. And, it, and I use that when, in wedding ceremonies. That you have a husband and a wife, they're in agreement then you put God in the middle of that also, and you can't be defeated. Now, doesn't it make sense that the enemy will come and try to separate you? 
Doesn't it make sense that the enemy will try to separate you so that you don't come into agreement? Doesn't it make sense to you that he will try to uh, separate you from God? The reason for all of this is in the same is true with the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower, remember when that seed is first sown, it's sown by the wayside, the birds come and eat it. Right? They just come down and gobble it up. And you find on later on in the, in the parable that the bird there being talked about is the devil. That's just people hear the word and they go, yeah, well, you know, it's just not that big a deal. Well, what happens is, is that word never has opportunity to, 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 bear, uh, to bear any root in a person's life when they, when they just receive it or they think of it casually about, well, that's, that's not what that's talking about. That's not really that important. All God wants us to be is just nice people. And if we're nice people, we'll go to heaven. Well, it is good to be nice, but being nice is not what causes you to go to heaven. Being nice is not what causes you to walk in victory or to walk as an overcomer. Walking in faith, walking in love are, are involved in those things. So we have to learn to do that. Well, the enemy doesn't want you to, so he steals the word very quickly, if he can, when it's sown into your heart. Then there's, uh, then, then there's sometimes we receive it with gladness, and we're excited, and oh boy, I learned so much today. But the Bible says when he's, when he's teaching the first part of the parable, he said, the sun comes up and scorches it because it doesn't have much root. This is the stony ground. And so what happens is, when he's explaining the parable, he says, because of offense. People hear the word of God, and then they get offended at something. And when they get offended, that it doesn't take root, and it's like the sun scorching seed that you put out, and, and it kills it. So it's very important where these things are concerned. All right, now I want you to back up with me here to verse 18. If you can grasp the meaning of verse 18, it will change your theology if it needs changing. And it will help you. It will help you understand how God works. It will help you understand your responsibility. It will help you understand things that will enable you to walk in victory and as an overcomer and to receive the things that God desires for you. Assuredly, or King James Bible says, Verily I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, this particular verse of Scripture, binding and loosing, we sometimes don't have a good grasp of this concept because we don't talk that way today. We don't talk about binding and loosing a whole lot. So, I'll, I'm going to read to you other translations. The English version says, And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. The Good News translation also words it that way. The New Living translation says, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit or allow on earth will be permitted in heaven. So, you can tell by these different translations, uh, the complete Jewish Bible says, yes, I tell you people that whatever you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Okay, so, do you think it would be okay for us to where we, we substitute the words here, uh, the word bind, we can substitute the word prohibit. Okay? If you bind something, you uh, prohibit it, you limit it, you forbid it. Okay? So, when you see bind in this particular verse of Scripture, it's talking about you prohibiting it or forbidding it. When you see loose in this particular verse of Scripture, it means permit or allow. Now then, it's a lot easier to understand this verse of Scripture. Verily I say to you, whatever you prohibit or forbid, on where? Hey, didn't we just look at that in verse 19? Didn't Jesus just say, in verse 19, that where two, two get together and agree on earth. All right. Wherever you bind on earth, we bind on earth. So whatever you prohibit or forbid on earth will be prohibited or forbidden in heaven. 
and whatever you allow or permit on earth will be allowed or permitted in heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. Or you, we can also say, if you want to look at the heavens, the area that's above us. All right. Let's look at this verse of Scripture. First of all, I want you to go back to your, in, in, at least in my day, go back to ninth grade English. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Go back to ninth grade English. Now, you learned this a little bit earlier in school, but it seems like in the ninth grade is really when you started getting into the complexities of diagramming sentences. How many of you have ever had to diagram a sentence? Yeah, everybody's hand going up. How many of you liked it? Not very many hands going up. Some, but not many. How many of you ever heard anybody say, what use is this, do we have for this? We're never going to use this stuff. Well, you know, I can honestly say that I don't have much need in my life for diagramming sentences. However, diagramming sentences helps you understand uh, grammar, syntax, and, and sentence structure a little bit better. Now, we're not going to diagram this whole sentence, so y'all all relax. Some of you are getting nervous look on your face right now. I, we're, not, we're not diagramming this sentence. But I do want to ask you this question. When Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Uh, what is the subject of the sentence? Who is the subject of the sentence? You are. Who is doing the binding and the loosing? Who is doing the prohibiting and the permitting who is doing the forbidding and the allowing who is doing that jesus is saying the you in this sentence is doing that now this the you that he's talking to is you he's talking to you so you are the one that's doing the binding the prohibiting the forbidding and you are the one that's doing the loosing, the allowing, the permitting. Okay? So you're doing that. And you are doing it from a particular location. Where is that location? On earth. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're doing that from the earth. So in your life... Your authority applies where? Where is your authority active? On the earth. Where do you happen to be living now? On the earth. That's good news, because that's where your authority is. Listen, this may come as a shock to you, but right now, you don't have a lot of say-so in heaven. I, I, mean, I don't know if you knew that. You're not determining a lot of the things going on in heaven. As a matter of fact, you're not determining anything that's going on in heaven. What you are determining are the things going on in your life, where? On the earth. But I want you to notice what happens here. He then talks about heaven. Now, now in the next verse... When we talk, when I, when I ask you to look at the difference, and I said I was going to show you this later on. Now is the later on. Remember I showed you uh, wherever any two of you on earth shall agree? It shall be done unto them of my Father which is in heaven. So in this particular verse of Scripture here, we're binding and loosing on, on the earth. And then things are being permitted or allowed or, 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 or prohibited and allowed in heaven. Now, who's the one that's deciding what's going on in heaven? God, the Father. So, apparently, now this is really important. Apparently, when you exercise authority on the earth by either... 
prohibiting something or allowing something, apparently when you do that on the earth in your proper position, your proper authority, then God backs it up where the heavens are concerned. Is that what that's talking about? Yes. Do you understand, if you get a hold of this, it'll change your life. There are so many people going through life that believe, if it's God's will, it'll happen in my life. If God wants me to get that job, I'll get that job. If God wants me to have that, He'll give that to me. Well, if the, have you ever heard anybody say, well, I'll see you next week. Yeah, if the Lord's willing. Well, why in the world would He not be willing? I mean, that's, just, that's something, it's a cliche that we have thrown around, and we have thrown it around so much that it's actually affected our, our belief system. You look at this particular verse of Scripture, written in red in your King James Bible, spoken by Jesus, you are the one that is doing the allowing in your life, and you are the one that is doing the prohibiting in your life. It originates with who? With you. In other words, God backs up what it is that you allow. So when you hear people say, we just don't know why the Lord allowed that to happen. He didn't. Do you know, excuse me. Do you know why He allowed it? Because you allowed it. Now see, right there is where people usually get up and walk out. Figuratively speaking. That's where people typically check out. Right there. When, when you explain to them most of what's going on in their life is not because God's wanting that to happen in their life. Most of what's going on in their life is because they're allowing it. They're not coming against it. They are not prohibiting the bad things and allowing the good things to come into their life. That's what that's talking about. This is talking about the curse and the blessing. You prohibit the curse, you allow the blessing to come in your life. How do you do that? Your mouth, the words that you speak. Oh my goodness, this COVID's going around, dear Lord. I, I mean, I, I got people in my family that have got it, dear Lord, I know we'll all get it. What'd you just do? You just took your mouth, so or so's the word, <laughs> you just took your mouth and sowed seed and gave permission for something to happen to you. Instead of saying, Jesus is my healer. I am protected from any plague, any pandemic. A thousand may fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it will not come near me. Psalm 91. See, do you see, do you see what I'm talking? The difference? Now, in those two illustrations right there, God had nothing to do with either one of them. You did. You were the one that decided. There are a number of times in our lives that God has been ready to move and ready to help us, and our mouth undid or our mouth prohibited that from happening. Now, people say, well, if God wants you to do something, it doesn't matter what you think, God can just do it anyway. No, He cannot. Does God have the ability? Is God powerful enough to do it? Well, of course He is. Nobody is doubting or questioning God's power. But you have to understand that things operate on the earth according to a legal system. They operate according to a contract or they operate according to a covenant. And we as believers, actually everybody on the planet is responsible for, but we have to operate according to that covenant, that agreement. And that agreement is set, up, set apart, set aside, it works a certain way. 
And one of the elements of that covenant is Jesus said that you will have what it is that you say. Remember, he told us about in, in chapter 4 of Mark's gospel, the parable of the sower, and then Mark's gospel chapter 11, he gives us the most concise teaching in the Bible on faith. Whosoever shall say unto the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. So when it comes to mountains in your life, you have to say something. And by you saying something, you are either prohibiting or allowing that thing in your life. Now then, what happens is, is when a person gets offended, when they get upset, when they get fearful, the wrong things start coming out of their mouth. Words of faith do not come out of their mouth. Words of fear come out of their mouth. Words of offense come out of their mouth. And so what they don't realize is, by allowing those words to come out of their mouth, they are either allowing something or prohibiting something. And they're, they're prohibiting the blessings and allowing the curse to come into their life. And then they think God's doing it to them. And it's, that's not the way that it works. Didn't Jesus, if you'll think about it, Jesus demonstrated this to us. When he was on every act, except one, every act that Jesus did on the earth, the Bible tells us that he did under the old covenant. He did it as a man under the old covenant. Everybody that he healed, every miracle that he performed, he did it as a man on the earth. Every miracle that you saw that Jesus did, if you'll recall, if you'll look back into the Old Testament, when Jesus commanded the sea to be still, do we have examples of people in the Old Testament that spoke to water and had miraculous things happen where water was concerned? Yes. Uh, Moses comes to mind. How about when... when the children of Israel, we forget when they're going into the, to, to the promised land. When they, go, they smite the water and then the priests step out and the, the water dries up on the Jordan River. So we find that happening. Uh, do you remember Elijah? Or Elisha takes Elijah's cloak and smites the river and it parts when he comes back. Matter of fact, the Jordan River, when it, when, the, when it saw a prophet coming, it didn't know whether it needed to stop or not. They were stopping that thing all the time. So we find examples of that. We find examples of Moses hitting a rock and water coming out of it. So we find miracles that have to do with water in the Old Testament. Do We find Jesus raising the dead. Do we find people raising the dead in the Old Testament? Yes. Uh, we find that Jesus multiplied food. Do we find that happening in the Old Testament? Yes. So Jesus operated the miracles that he did. We had seen those miracles happen before. The one thing that he did that had never been done before and never done since, and only he could do it, was he died. He paid the sacrifice as the spotless Lamb of God and redeemed us. But he operated as a man. The thing he said, remember in John chapter 14. The things that I do shall ye do also. And greater works than these because I go to my Father which is them. Well, he didn't say that just to the disciples. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. The works that I do shall they do also. And remember the last time that I mentioned that verse of Scripture, I asked you if you were believers. Every one of you raised your hand. He's talking to you. So, you see... It would be a lot easier to walk in these things, to walk in the abundance that the Scripture provides for us, to walk in the God kind of life that the Scripture provides for us if we didn't have anything opposing us. But you have to understand, there's somebody out there that doesn't like you. God has a will for you. God desires good things for you, but you have got to understand that there is an enemy out there that has a plan and a will for you also. 
and that will for you is to kill you, steal from you, or destroy you. So not everything happening in your life is according to God's plan. Some things trying to happen in your life are according to the enemy's plan. And you have to learn to differentiate between the two. And how is it you determine whose plan operates in your life? By the words that you speak. So, just the same, the same way that God desires for you to speak the Word of God, God desires for you to speak His Word so that you will have His will and His blessings in your life. So the enemy wants you to speak His fear-based words so that you will have what it is He desires for you, which is destruction and death. So who chooses which one of those things operate in your life? You do. You do. Now it's a lot easier to believe that we just go through life and whatever happens, that was just God. He just wanted us to do that. I don't know why he wanted us to go through that, but, you know, his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts and he knows what he's doing. Well, he does know what he's doing. But a lot of the stuff happening in your life, God's not the one that's behind it. I'm talking about the bad stuff. God's not the one that's behind that. It's the enemy that's behind it. And you have to learn to be able that when that stuff comes against you, You have to learn to be able to stand against it and resist it. And then Jesus said in verse 19, when you agree in prayer, it'll be done to you of of His Father, our Father, which is in heaven. I want you to look up with me. Verse 15 in your Bible, this chapter, Matthew 18. Verse 15. I'm going to close with this section here. I may pick this up next week. So we've talked about prohibiting, allowing, agreeing, things being done for us of our Father. Look at verse 15. Look at what leads into this. This is what Jesus was talking about that led into the verses that I just showed you. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Didn't Jesus just say that in verse 19 where your faith is concerned? Same thing establishes here. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Jesus is talking about... What he leads into, the things that I just talked to you about, prohibiting and allowing, he leads leads into that with a brother getting offended. And he says, if there is a problem between you and a brother, you go to him and you talk to him. And if he won't hear you, then you take two or three people with you and go with you and talk to him. And if he won't hear that, then you bring it before the church. And then if he won't hear that, you boot him. There are many examples in the Bible. Deuteronomy, Numbers come to mind. There are examples in the Bible where the Bible says to get the sin out of the camp. You cannot allow stuff like that to go on. You try to restore a one. You try to help reconcile someone. And there is a process to do. As a matter of fact, the principle that I'm just describing to you, uh, when you join this church, when you become a member of this church and you go through membership classes, we have a class that's called Reconciling Conflict. And we go over this in detail. As the pastor of this church, I don't tolerate that in the church. If I see that two people in the church have a problem with one another, we have a system. We have people set up that if the two of them don't resolve it, then I've, I've got some people in the church that will go to them and go with one to try to resolve it. 
And then if they don't, then it comes before me. And then after it comes before me, it comes before the board. And if it's not resolved in, they're asked to leave. Now I can tell you in over 20 years of pastoring this church, we've never ever gotten to that point. Most of the time, as a matter of fact, I can only think of one instance that this wasn't the case. Most of the time, when you, when you instruct one to go to the other and discuss it, it's resolved. We've only had, it, we've only had one that's even got to level two, and it was resolved. Now, why is that? I know, I know some of you out there may be thinking, my goodness. I don't know if I want to go to that church. That pastor's picky. You cannot allow offense to come into a congregation. It is a poison. You get two people in your church that are mad at each other. Natural human nature is you're going to choose sides. People in the church are going to start choosing sides. And it's going to create division. Is division of God? Nope. It's the enemy trying to come in and, and split your church. He does the same thing with your family. He does the same thing at your work. He does the same thing at school. It's the same tactic. You just can't fall for it. So the, the, the context that we were talking about, where you agree and where you exercise dominion, where you prohibit, where you allow, is actually talking about somebody that gets offended at you. And it actually says, uh, a brother. So to us, that would mean a fellow Christian. This isn't talking about a heathen. This is talking about somebody you go to church with. This is talking about a fellow believer. So avoid offense. It's not worth it. Being mad and offended at somebody is not worth what it will cost you. It may feel good to your flesh to be mad for a moment. It is not worth what it will cost you. Walk in love. Walk in grace. Walk in kindness towards one another. So that the things that you're believing for, so that your faith through love will continue to operate in your life and you will enjoy, experience the blessings of God in your life. Amen? Amen. We'll close there for today. I trust that you receive something out of that, something that will be a blessing to you. Be attentive not to get offended. Don't be easily offended. All right. Well, at this time, we would like to receive our morning tithes and offerings here at the church those of you that are watching digitally you may uh, participate if you would like in your living room or wherever you are if if you're driving we ask that you pull over at this time uh, but we'd like to do our confession so if you would stand up with me we'll do our offering confession everyone together simultaneously as I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us this morning. My desire for you is that God's richest and best be yours. And remember, there is victory in Jesus.